So I'm on the ballot for Tuesday's election. No one prophesies about me. <laughs> and I can't figure out how you get in that realm where that. So maybe that'll happen before the day's out, but now it's too late. I just ruined it by saying that. Uh, Habakkuk chapter, chapter 2, verse 14 says this. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And even as Larry talked today about uh, where's the world going? Well, that's where it's gone. Amen. The knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Both the Hebrew and the Greek word for knowledge is not simply that, okay, everybody's going to hear about Jesus. Well, that's definitely part of it. It's experience. It's soaked. It's an awareness that you can sense. And the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. If you're in the sea, there's no way, there's no place that you can go to get away from the glory of God. You're going to get wet because water is in the sea. And the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as, in the same way, just like waters cover the sea. That means the sea is defined by water. That means the day is coming in which the earth will be defined by the glory of the Lord. That's where it's gone. And I feel like this is going to be kind of hard to share today. Over the past four months, the Lord has given me something that now I'm tasked with giving away. And receiving is easier than giving. So I rest on him to communicate something that he's brought me to faith for. Hebrews 11 says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the conviction of things not seen. Faith is not hope. Hope is great. It's nice. Live in hope. I'm, be, be glad for hope. It's not faith. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. In other words, it's almost like the way that you can define that a little bit. It's like um, faith, the assurance is that, that it's almost like the legal deed to your house or to the lease that you rent or your place that you rent. In other words, it's some sort of legal document that determines if it, it belongs to you. So hope is things that we would desire but then the legal document, which is the word of God, actually defines what is rightfully yours. And we also recognize that in the world in which we live, that some of those things that are rightfully ours are robbed from us or taken from us or usurped or whatever way you want to say that. So faith is the assurance of things hoped for. It's the, it's the, it's the legal document that de determines what is rightfully ours. It's the conviction of things not seen. And the conviction part is, when God steps into the picture and says, and you will have that. This is what is rightfully yours. And so we all have those moments where, okay, we know what the word of God says and we're, we're pressing through for it. But then there's those times when it comes, when, when it's almost like it just releases and you know, like the judge in heaven has, the gavel has gone down and you've said, okay, and, and he has said, you will have this very thing that I have for you. And then it's just simply a matter of it being carried out. I feel like I've come to that place over, specifically the presence of the Lord. Romans 10 uh, verse 17 says, says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Up until the past number of months, it's, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I never really studied that passage in depth because it seemed very clear in the English. And what I didn't realize was that hearing comes by the word it is not the logos word. It is not the written word. It's the rhema. It's the prophetic word. Faith comes by hearing the word of the Lord. So my desire is to see us come to ever increasing levels of faith in one specific area. Now, when it comes to faith, of course, it's the assurance that we hope for. So in other words, there's got to be something in the word. We just can't just pull hope out of the air and say, okay, we're just going to make it faith. It's got to be based upon the word. So I'm going to share with you two things, and we're going to go into something in a place of prayer in response. So one, from beginning to end, and because you know the word, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spend time. I'm gonna, this is gonna be an overview because actually what I wanna get to is prayer. 
God consistently wants to be with his people. I'm not going to quote scripture. I'm not going to read scriptures. We don't have time for that. But in Genesis chapter one, of course, God, he creates man and woman. They're in the garden. They're co-creating. They're naming animals and so forth. And he comes to this place. He's having regular fellowship with people. And you all know the story. We know what happens in Genesis where the, the uh, Adam and Eve, they take a step outside of the will of the Lord. They eat this fruit that they were not supposed to eat and so forth. And the Lord shows up in the garden. And when he shows up in the garden saying, where are you and what have you done? Now, do you ever think that God ever asks a question because he doesn't know? Did he not know where they were? Did he not know what they were done, had done? Did he come to the place where he's saying, okay, you've rebelled against me and you've eaten this fruit, you've, you've, you've usurped my authority, and so therefore I'm staying away. No, he knew fully what he, they had done and he pursued them. And what I wanted you to see is consistently, like we could go through almost every single book of the Bible and we see where, where God consistently pursues and wants to be with his people, not because they're perfect, but because he's perfect and he's good and he actually wants to be with his people. And he comes to this place, Cain and Abel, he pursues them. Uh, Abraham, I can just go through these lists of you know, Jacob who was mentioned, all of these men of the Bible, men and women of the Bible that were like us, fallen creatures. And yet God wanted to be with them. And then we come to this place that's a bit of a climax, which is Exodus chapter 19. And he tell, Moses tells the people, they're of course out from the slavery. And he says, I want to be with my people. So I'm going to descend on this mountain. And you draw everybody up to the mountain and, and, and be prepared because I'm going to come. I'm going to speak to the people directly from the mountain. And so they all gather around and the glory of God descends upon the mountain. And he, you know, lightnings and peals of thunder and the voice of the Lord, like, you know, that story. And the people were afraid and they backed away and said to Moses, no, I, we don't want to be with God. You go to God and you get the experience and you get the word of the Lord and you come to us and you tell us. In other words, they said, we are going to be satisfied with an, a, one degree of separation from the presence of the Lord. Like we just, because we just can't handle it, we're afraid. And Moses, if you read that passage in, in Exodus 19, he pleads with them, no, don't make this fatal mistake of drawing back from the Lord, but he's drawn you near. And we know that story. You know, there's no, there's no indication of what we call the Old Testament tabernacle system before Exodus 19. You want my limited you know, understanding? Um, I don't think God ever wanted the Old Testament tabernacle system. He wanted to be with his people. They didn't want him. And so what he did was, okay, we'll go to plan B. And we're going to borrow ideas that this group had found from other pagan societies in the way that they manage their gods. And I'm going to actually conform myself to it just so I can be with my people. I could go passage after passage. Matthew chapter 1, Jesus is stepping into the world. And the prophet speaking out of Isaiah chapter 8, his name shall be. Now, you know, if you have kids, naming a kid's a pretty big deal. We have a grandson's two, year, two weeks old, and we didn't know if it was a boy or girl. They didn't want to find out, so they didn't tell names or anything. And then, so the baby was born on a Tuesday, so didn't get a name on Tuesday, didn't get a name on Wednesday. But, okay, well, I can, I, I'm all right. Just whenever you get around to it. Uh, I think you're overthinking the name thing a little bit too much. And so Thursday, yeah, the child did have a name. His name is James. But you make it a big deal. What did God name his, per, his son? God with us. He wants to be with us so much that even in given the name, in take, remember, he didn't, he didn't even name himself. He called himself the great I am. We could go on, Matthew 28, behold, I am with you, even to the very end of the age. Revelation 22, um, the dwelling place of God is with man. 
And I want you to notice the word order there because it doesn't say the dwelling place of mankind is with God. It says the dwelling place of God is with man. Why? He wants to be with us. Friends, I could do two hours on this topic of God revealing God's heart to be with his people. And I hope that's enough just to, for that to be confirmed. That's, that's, again, it's the assurance of things that we hope for. It's, it's what's actually in the word and what's communicated. But then I wanna, I wanna go to step two, that other part of that, which is from Exodus 33. And you don't need to turn there. You know the story, Jimmy referred to it as well. Um, and I'm gonna go directly to Exodus 33. And you know the story. I just mentioned Exodus 19. God had invited his people up to the mountain. They didn't want to go. And so honestly, I think because of that, they made a false God because they wouldn't encounter the real God. And Moses was up on the mountain encountering the real God and they're down in the valley, you know, building false gods and falling down and worshiping. And uh, it's not going well. So I love the way God and Moses, you know, systematically disowned people. <laughs> will say things like, Moses will say, God, these people you gave me, like they're yours, like your, your people that you gave me. And then in that case, Moses, God says to Moses, go down, those people well, that you have, your people have done this. And so they're just like, no, they're your people. No, they're your people. No, they're your people. And uh, so they straighten all that out. We come to Exodus 33 and you have like, it's almost like if you could feel like the dust has now settled and this disaster has been kind of mopped up, triaged. Still needs to be fixed, but triaged. And we have this conversation that occurs between God and Moses. In Exodus 32, verse 34, God says to Moses, but go now, lead the people to the place about which I have spoken to you. Behold, my angel will go before you and nevertheless, and the day when I visit, I will visit their sin upon them. Then Exodus 33. So he says, I'm not, I'm not going to go. We go into chapter 33, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses again, depart, go up from here. You and the people you have brought up out of the land of Egypt, out of the land to which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you. And I will drive out all the ites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, and I will not go up among you, lest I consume you along the way, for you're a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned for no one put on their ornaments, for the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people, you're a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So I want you to notice a little bit what's happening here. God is always fulfilling his promises. And it's almost like he's standing before, or Moses is standing before God and they're having this conversation. And he's saying, hey, listen, just go up. I'm gonna, I will make sure you get everything I promised that I would give you. The land flowing in milk and honey, the vineyards you didn't plant, the houses you didn't build, it is all yours. You will simply lack one thing, me. And then he even says why. He says, in the beginning, he says, lest I consume you, meaning that it's a possibility. Like if you just step out of line, I'm just, I've, I've reached the end. Like he said, lest I'll consume you. But later on, it takes it to the next level saying, I would consume you. Like you, you, I, you're probably going to die if I go along with you. So it's almost like a deal or no deal where God is talking to Moses and said, listen, I'm going to make you a deal. Everything I ever promised you, all the prosperity, all the fulfillment, all the health, all the strength, all the glory, it's all yours. I will even give you an abundance of supernatural activity because I will send my angel in front of you. But you're going to have it all. You're going to have it all but you won't have me. That's door number one. Door number two is me. Along with me, everything that I've promised you, 
but you might die in the process. So over here, Moses says, no, not going. He ignores the offer. Actually, what happens in Exodus 32, as it comes to a close, he says, I will send my angel before you. Exodus 33, verse one and two, I will send my angel before you. Do you know what Moses' complaint is? He says, you keep telling me to go up, but you won't tell me what, who's going with us. How many times did God specifically tell him who was going with him? Twice. You know what? He's ignoring the deal. I posted something online for sale recently. And it was in good shape. It was pretty new. You know, I knew what I would cost. I actually put, put, posted the original bill of sale um, so that people could see and know how old it was and everything. And somebody sends me a, yeah, the people lowball stuff. Don't you almost get insulted by such a low deal? And so Moses, hey, God's speaking to Moses. I'm going to give you everything you want. You just won't have me. I'm going to ignore you even said that. I'm going to ignore that you even said that. Because Moses says, I will take my chances on dying, but I will have you. And I would risk death so I could have you. And in this kind of personal awakening that I'm walking through in the past four months with this and uh, trying to study even, like even what the Bible says, even in this passage in Exodus 33, where he says, no one can see God and live. Well, first of all, I thought, well, then let's just die and be done with it. <laughs> you know? I mean, how about we just... Like, you don't seem real enthused by that, but I'm just thinking, saying, like, if, if we can actually experience the Lord to the point that it actually kills us, like, that isn't the worst case scenario. It really is not. But then I began to study, I think, about, like, all the times where people actually saw God. Like, you study through Scripture, and they'll, they'll say, like, oh, my goodness, I saw God, and I'm still alive. Like, how did that happen? Like, there's multiple times through Scripture where it actually occurs. And so I take a look at this Exodus 33 where God says, no, you can't see me and live, that it was actually speaking to Moses specifically because I think he actually had something for the corporate environment which came to the surface in Exodus 42 where the glory of the Lord came into the tabernacle and they couldn't even do their duties because God was there. So I feel like we see the heart of God that he wants to be with his people. But then the heart of God was matched with somebody on the earth that wanted to be with him as much as he wanted to be with them. And there was agreement. It's Matthew 18, verse 19. If two are together, you agree to anything. That's the word that we get our words sym symphony from. Like if you're saying the same thing, there's a connection it's kind of like in science when lightning both comes from the sky but also comes from the earth and it somehow connects and it meets. And it's almost like spiritually there's truth that exists in heaven and it looks for a, a point of reference on the earth. It's, it looks for a place of agreement on the earth that we would agree with what the word says and we would simply actually pull down the truth from heaven with our agreement. And I wonder if, if God would be looking for a people that would simply just want to be with him as much as he wants to be with us. That we would say, you know, God, I love when healing happens. I love that, I do. <laughs> but all your promises of you know, prosperity and all that you give us, and man, the blessings just pour out. But if you were placed in a deal like Moses was, which would you choose? I think we're in a season now where um, God's looking for those places that would just welcome the presence of the Lord. And I think he's ready. You know, this book I have on the table, 
Everybody's giving their books away. This is not my, this is my book by possession. It's not my book by authorship. And you can't have it. It's out of, it's out of print. And as we've talked about this very thing here on uh, our staff team and such, and some of the things that God wants to do here at ECC, I think, that, uh, so Jim got a hold of this book for me. I've read it, I don't know, multiple times. I just sit and soak in the reality of what it would be like if God would just simply come. Or that you would rend the heavens and come down to us. It's not a pipe dream. It's real. It's happened. And I, I nurture my soul on the stories from 1850. Even the crew of ships anchored outside New York Harbor experienced the power of God's presence. It's said that when ships came near New York Harbor, it was as if they entered a zone where there was a divine presence. On one ship, a captain and 30 crew members were converted to Christ before they docked. Revival broke out in the battleship, the North Carolina. Four sailors started to meet for prayer down the depths of the ship. One evening, they started singing under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and a group of their ungodly soulmates, shipmates came running down to mock them. God's presence was so strongly felt that right there on the spot, they humbly fell to the floor in repentance. In 1949, Duncan Campbell let me tell you what revival is. An evangelistic campaign or special meeting is not revival. Successful evangelistic campaign or crusade, there'll be hundreds, even thousands of people making decisions for Christ. But the community remains untouched. Churches continue much the same as before. In revival, God suddenly moves in the district. Suddenly, the community becomes God-conscious, The Spirit of God grips men and women in such a way that even work is given up to people as people give on waiting upon the Lord. The Spirit of God was so wonderfully resting on every township in the region. His presence was in the homes of people on the meadow, moorland, even the public roads. The presence of God is a supreme characteristic of a God-sent revival. Of the hundreds who found Christ, 75% were saved before ever coming to a church building because the presence of God filled the regions. Sometimes the manifest presence of God creates a divine radiation zone, all coming within that expanded spiral of tangible power are brought under the awesome are brought under awesome conviction. In 1859, no town in Unster was more deeply stirred than Colerain. A schoolboy in a class became so troubled about his soul that the schoolmaster sent him home. An older boy, a Christian, went with him, and before they had gone far, they had led him to Christ. Returning to the school, this new convert testified to his teacher. I'm so happy I have the Lord Jesus in my heart. These artless words had an astonishing effect as boy after boy arose and left the room. Going outside, the teacher found these boys all on their knees, ranged along the, the, the wall of the playground. Very soon, their silent prayer became a little cry. They were heard by another class inside and pierced their hearts. They fell on their knees and the cry for mercy was heard and turned by the girls' class upstairs. In a few moments, the whole school was on their knees, neighbors and passers-by flocking in 
And as they cross the threshold, under the same convicting power, every room was filled with men, women, children seeking God. I think the time is now. I think God wants to do that here. And for you. The glory of the Lord, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. God's heart is clear. He's revealed himself to us in scripture. The only question that remains, will we come in to an agreement with that truth and desire God as much as he desires us? Can we just pray? And I don't mean, I don't, I'm not gonna pray. We pray. I want to just begin to express your heart before the Lord. Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? He who, has a, who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. Does not lift up his soul to what is false. He will receive blessing from the Lord and vindication from God his Savior. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O you gates, be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory, the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle? Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory, the Lord Almighty? He is the King of glory. Lord, in all weakness, in all insecurity, in all the unknown of what it's like to actually open the doors that the King of glory may come in. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, we swing wide the gates. And we say, King of glory, will you come? Will you manifest? May the stories that we hear of 1950s, of 1850s, may we live in that here and now. In every place that's represented in this room. May we be carriers of your presence. So Lord, we swing wide the gates to our lives, to our families, to our churches, to our ministries, to our businesses. And even as we represent various regions around the world, God, we swing wide the gates for your glory to come, not just in a meeting, not just in a special time, but every place that the knowledge of the glory of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Amen.